after the war, Alan Turing, who had been working on breaking the German codes at Bletchley, joined the mathematics division when it was formed at NPL in 1945. He came to this building, Teddington Hall, with the rest of the division in October of that year, and he set to work to outline a detailed plan for an electronic computer, something which didn't exist at all at that time. Uh, in the following year, uh, experimental work was started in this building and I worked in the cellars with Alan Turing trying to get an acoustic delay line to work. This is Dr. Jim Wilkinson who was uh, with me. Uh, he was working with Turing already when I joined the laboratory. He was part-time uh, on the numerical analysis work and uh, when Turing came he divided his time between that and helping to develop the pilot ACE. Tell us, uh, Jim, what, what was the significance of, do you think, of Turing's early work here? Oh, well, without it, of course, we obviously would never have built a machine and it wouldn't have had that um, uh, distinctive flavor, which one uh, is very characteristic of Turing. The machine was very different, as you know, from, from all the other computers that was built. And I think that was entirely to, due to Turing's influence and the work we did here at that time. The work that uh, was going on uh, here during 1946 seems to me was uh, nothing to do with practical electronics. No, at that time it wasn't. Turing had already uh, produced a design for the executive committee um, and when I came he was working on what he called version 5 of the pilot ace and the way we proceeded in, in, at that time was to attempt to code up some useful problem in numerical mathematics and in the light of doing it, we would decide that the current machine had certain inadequacies, and so we would have a process of continuous modification of the design. And that, I think, was the position when you, uh, when you came. If I remember rightly, we were probably on version 5, and you started uh, learning about electronic computers, the design of them, this and started right. to program some things yourself. Yes, about July of 46. So, uh, at the end of 46, Jim, how do you see the position? Well, we'd, we'd reached version 7. Version 6, I think, was a, was a very short-lived one. Version 7 was a very significant advance. Uh, logical, uh, the logical design was significantly different from that of 5. And we had, certainly on paper, uh, decided the, the general form of version 7. Mm -hmm. But there's little doubt in my mind that, that 1947 was the year that, uh, that, that really set the, uh, set the ACE project going almost everything that was to affect it later on happened in 47. Um, it started off with Harry Husky joining us in January of 1947 when, it, as it happened, Turing was in the United States attending a conference. Husky came fresh from his triumphs with ENIAC, which was the first electronic computer but wasn't a stored program computer. And he came and for a while he worked with uh, with, with you and uh, myself, if you remember, we... In uh, fact, excuse me interrupting, but right over there in that building was where we worked. That, that's right. That, that, yes. that, that was the very place. And we um, introduced him to version 7, which um, I think he was rather surprised at the, um, uh, at the uh, rather unusual nature of the design there, but he picked it up very quickly. Um, and we got along very well with him. He did some programming, he suggested some modifications for, 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 to version 7, and that was the point at which uh, Husky came back. One event which uh, is quite characteristic of Turing, he didn't spend too long at the laboratory at the time. He was visiting a Manchester and uh, King's Cambridge. But uh, when he came back from one of these occasions, he didn't know of this work that Husky was doing. And he looked over my shoulder to see what I was doing. I had written a preliminary piece of program for this new Husky machine. And of course I gave it a name, version H. And he looked over my shoulder and he said, what's this version H? <laughs> and then it, then it transpired that behind his back, Husky had had the nerve to try to design a, a computer. And he wasn't at all pleased at that. You remember the event? Yes, oh yes, I remember he was uh, definitely rather spiky for a day or two. Um, Turing had these, these moods, but they would usually pass. They didn't mean too much. Uh, you just had to weather the storm and get on with something else. Um, there was one thing, one other thing, I think, that would press uh, Husky into trying to, to rush the project. There was, of course, the prime consideration that he only had a year here anyway. 
But then we were also beginning to have our competitors by that time. Wilkes was starting to work on the, uh, the construction of the electronic computer at Cambridge, which was later to become the EDSEC. Um, uh, Professor Freddie Williams and Tom Kilburn uh, started work on the project at Manchester, and they were working in particular on the design of a, a novel form of storage using a cathode ray tube. Uh, this was a very ingenious thing, and Husky was very much uh, attracted by it, but not sufficiently to try and incorporate that in the, in the one year into, into the pile of days. But of course, this competition began to um, add a bit of a spur to our endeavor, and uh, perhaps um, in Husky's case, um, was an extra additional spur to trying to get the thing done during the course of his year. Yeah. Well, now, where, how did, do you see the uh, actual electronics work and the gathering of a team at NPL uh, uh, d developing? I understood it was in August 47 that Newman came, Ted Newman, from EMI with knowledge of pulse techniques, which was the first yes, introduction that, we that's, had. That's, that's right. It was about that time. In, um, when I first came, the decision appeared to have been taken by, by the director, Sir Charles Darwin, and, and uh, Turing, that we would not build the computer at NPL. Mm -hmm. We would get some outside body, either the uh, post office or some group in the Ministry of Supply with experience of pulse techniques, uh, to build the computer for us. So. How do you see the pilot ace construction actually getting underway, Jim? Yeah, by that time, we, there were four or five of us in the mathematics team. Right? Yes. We'll be talking about some of them, I suppose, later on. Uh, but um, uh, nothing really much happened with our group. We wrote up a, a big report of what we what had done. It was combined efforts published under my name, but I think almost yes. everybody uh, associated with it contributed. Um, and then uh, in round about March of 48, mm -hmm. Thomas finally left. Yes. And Turing then decided that he was going to leave NPL and go to Manchester. Uh, and there we were with the um, program in, in a rather unsatisfactory situation. Mm. And to be perfectly frank, I, th I thought at the time in danger of foundering. Yes. Um, and if you remember, it was that time that Colebrook was appointed in charge of the electronic succession in, um, in, in succession to Thomas. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, probably something that you didn't know too much about at the time, but Colebrook came over to me and he said, I've inherited this thing. He said, it doesn't seem to be in a very healthy state. And I said, well, um, they will be my own, my own words too. And mm -hmm. he said, um, how about uh, the four of you, and there were by that time four of yes. us, we've been joined by Orway um, and uh, um, uh, Dr. Da uh, Mr. Davis, who's now in in uh, was for some time in charge of the, um, uh, of the computer science division. How about the four of you coming over and joining my team and working together on the design, possibly, of some pilot machine? And so that's precisely what happened. Yes. Remember, we yes. went over, <laughs> cycling over with some of the equipment we had, a very uh, amusing episode. I remember I cycled over with a COSA oscilloscope on my, my handlebar. Oh, bicycle. So the next important uh, thing, uh, I suppose, would be uh, when the machine was actually demonstrated, or rather when it first worked. That, that's right. It didn't... Well, when we really got down to building it, it didn't really take as long as all that. I mean, we mm. couldn't have really started to lay out the, the chassis until toward the end of 48. And yet by the end of 49, we were beginning to put the assembled things on to the computer. Mm -hmm. And it was finally in May of 1950 uh, that uh, we had sufficient of it assembled for the machine to work, in the sense that it stored the program uh, in, its, in its memory and it executed that program. So um, May 1950 was the, gr was the great day. Now you, you, you must surely tell me the story, Jim, of how Sir Edward Bullard, who was director at that time, uh, had asked you, could he be told when it first worked? Oh, yes. Well, that was an interesting story. We had to change of director, of course, in 1950. And uh, uh, Teddy Bullard, or Sir Edward Bullard, as he later became, he came to see us fairly early on, and I remember he said to me, well, how's it going? And I said, well, it's, it's going pretty well. We should have something working quite soon. And he was obviously extremely skeptical. He'd heard about the early um, bad times that we were having, 
it seemed to be well known. Uh, Husky, I think, had, had made no secret of his disillusionment when he left. And so he didn't really believe me. And I persisted. And so he said, well, as soon as it works, you must, uh, you must call me. Uh, and so when it did work, I tried to get in touch with him. And of course, we couldn't get him. And so I paced up and down saying, where's the bloody director? You can never find him when you want him. And I said this several times. And just as I'm about to say it again, he stepped in through the window and he said, well, here's the bloody director, he said. Uh, and I said, well, we have it working. Of course, uh, Boy was not a man to worry about things of that kind. He was not at all put out. And I demonstrated this, uh, the, the, the machine to him. And by the grace of God, it did work while he was there. Okay. It wasn't a very, uh, uh, very uh, grand program, as you can might imagine. The machine was in a very primitive state. And uh, he was obviously very pleased and rather surprised that it was working. But he turned to me and he said, the program's less than epoch making, he said. And that, <laughs> I had to admit, was true. The next day, he came down with a very large problem for us. And I told him the machine wasn't quite ready for that. Um, I think uh, he was really pulling our legs when he, uh, when, when he appeared with this program. But we, had a, we had a public press show, didn't we? We had a public press show. We did indeed, yes. That, perhaps a few words about that, that would be in order. That was perhaps the most remarkable episode in the, the whole history of the machine. As soon as the computer worked, we came under continuous pressure from the very enthusiastic director to have it demonstrated. And it was with some difficulty that we could hold it back uh, for a few months while we made it more reliable. But finally, I think it must have been in December of 1950, right. we decided to have a, a, a press demonstration. And in fact, this ordeal was to last three days. I, believe, I believe, yes. The first, yes. the first day we would have the popular press, and then we were going to have the technical press, and then on the third day we were going to have VIPs, including right. our competitors from, from Cambridge and Manchester. So right. that, was, that was perhaps the most testing day of all. Well, to be perfectly frank, the machine ne had never worked really well up mm. to that time, and the chances that it would give a flawless or even an acceptable demonstration over those three days was really rather small. Mm -hmm. And to everybody's amazement, and to, 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 to more to ours than anybody else because we knew uh, it's rather shaky condition, it proceeded to give the most impeccable performance. I don't think it failed on any single occasion during the whole of those three days. It must have been the most remarkable good luck story that's ever been told about a computer. Yes. And so that, that, that brought us to the end of 1950. So we ended 1950 on a, a high note, I think, um, Perhaps a false note, because the machine wasn't really as good as, as most people thought it was. No, it worked rather by good luck, because mm. I recall that we were trying to gate very narrow pulses together, much mm. narrower than one should be able to, and we had indeed, so you had to redesign the circuitry of the control. Yes. yes. This machine...